So my topic tonight is making the sacred, making the Rosicrucian. This past spring at Rosicrucian Park, there was a week long deep dive immersion that coincided with the 12th degree initiation. I met some longtime members and some of them were there just for the deep dive and others were there for the initiation and they stayed for the deep dive. And in spending the immersion week with everyone, I realized that I had a lasting impression of many members that they had just a beautiful sense of refinement about themselves. They were at peace, they were secure in themselves, and they were quite humble, and a seed was planted. I became very curious about their Rosicrucian journeys and their experience and how they became who they are. A few were gracious enough to let me interview them. So now in the fall, we all get to reap the harvest and the perspective of their wisdom and hear from some of these longtime members. So my presentation tonight will be in two parts. The first part is called the invitation. And this is about the invitation that the monographs bring to us. The second part is called the gift. And it's about the gift that comes from years of study and practice. Now, this, of course, is the cover of the monographs. We've all seen this. And the monographs are rich in ancient knowledge and symbology. And the cover is no different. On the cover of every monograph, we're presented with three key areas of focus that I'll talk about today. The first is that of the temple. We see an entrance to a temple. Now, the temple is a place of learning and a container of the sacred mysteries. Since the temple is also a metaphor for the body, this is also referring to the temple of us, our psyches and our minds and hearts and our outer physical temples. And as we go through the journey of our studies, we strengthen our temple by internalizing the wisdom contained in the monographs and from ourselves. At the base, it is composed of a row of onks, you can see down there, sometimes called the cross of life, sometimes called the crux and sata, and it represents immortal life. At the top is the winged solar disk fused with the amoric seal. The seal is composed of the onk and a downward facing triangle with a rose cross in the center. The winged solar disk represents power, enlightenment, and the divine one source. The downward triangle represents the divine creation. You also see the Rosicrucian seal in the middle of the entry, and you see the seal with the rose cross in the center, and then you see the two triangles. The downward triangle represents divine creation, while the triangle pointing upwards represents the material creation. And then we see the Latin name of the ancient mystical order Rosae Crucis. And above that, we see Cro-Mat, which means as in truth. So we are here presented at the door, at the step, at the enfoldment of the entry to the temple. We are entering the world of truth, and we are invited to find out about our true selves. This is a quote that I really liked from the Rosicrucian manual and it talks about the temple. And it says to us, the true temple of which we hope to be masters is the body of man, finding its counterpart in the universe, which is the temple of God. The temple of God is universal, non-sectarian, charged with cosmic powers and vibrating forces and designed by the master architect to continue his creative work in love, goodness, and justice. The second area of focus is that of the quotation on the bottom. Know thyself, and thou shalt know the universe and the gods. From day one, we are presented with our great task. We are taught that becoming a Rosicrucian means coming to know ourselves. I think we can all have an appreciation for how hard this can be. And Benjamin Franklin summed it up well with this quote from Little Richard's Almanac from 1750. He said, there are three things extremely hard, steel, a diamond, 
and to know oneself. Luckily, even though this is difficult, we are guided through the process with the monographs. And through the monographs, we have many experiments and practices and lessons to help deepen our knowledge of ourselves. And that knowledge gained through the experiences brings us gnosis. Gnosis is an experiential deep knowledge. And many of the experiments help us to deeply experience ourselves and have the gnosis of the greater reality inside and out of ourselves. So if we go even deeper, to know ourselves is also to have experienced ourselves on many different levels. And as you go through the monographs and go through the practices, you build up many levels of knowledge about yourself through the experiments and the meditations and the different practices and lessons. And here's a quote from the Rosicrucian Manual about knowledge. H. Spencer Lewis writes, the Rosicrucians ever held that one could not know of anything except through personal experience. For this reason, a distinction was made between belief and knowledge. The experience, which is thus necessary, may be through objective realization or psychic reality, but there must be the personal realism. And we also sense immediately that this statement is an application of the hermetic axiom as above, so below. That which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below. Everything is related, and we are but a microcosm of a greater macrocosm. As we come to know ourselves, we also come to know the universe and divinity. And if you haven't already, you may want to meditate on this phrase and see what this means to you. Now this inscription was said to be carved above the entrance to the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And it was also said to be inscribed in gold so that it could not be missed. Now why was this at the entrance to the Oracle at Delphi? Because therein begins the journey. Even though they've completed the physical journey to the oracle, the inner journey, in many ways, begins and ends with this axiom. So let's look for a moment. Again, why would this be at the entrance to the oracle at Delphi? Before we come seeking knowledge, we should know our own truths. And before we come seeking knowledge and wisdom, we should know whether we'll be best able to use it or not, or judge whether it's actually even wise. Before we come seeking wisdom, we should know how we view the world and what our shortcomings could be and are. In self-knowledge comes self-esteem, to have agency in the world, to enact what the oracle tells you. And what good is outside knowledge if we haven't done our own self-examination and if we haven't taken the time to get to know ourselves and we take knowledge of ourselves for granted? When we don't know the truth of ourselves, and we don't accept ourselves, we can easily project our fears and problems onto others, causing more problems. And we also benefit from the ability to see the truth and see situations for what they truly are, to see beyond the veil. And if you know yourself, then the conversation with the Oracle takes on a whole new higher level of meaning. We can see this very clearly in a modern example. In the movie, The Matrix, there's one scene where the Oracle is in her kitchen baking cookies when Neo, the protagonist, enters the room. And he's been sent to ask her whether he is the character known as the One. The One is the person that can see beyond the veil of the Matrix and that can manipulate time and space to save humanity. So in the movie scene, she asks, so what do you think? Do you think you're the one? And he says, I don't know. And so then she points to the top of the entry of her kitchen doorway, which is the image that you see on the right. And it says, Timit Noske. And she points and she says, you know what that means? It's Latin, it means know thyself. 
And she goes on to tell him that to know something about yourself is to feel it through and through. And of course, oracles speak in paradoxes. So she goes on to tell him that he is not the one. She gives him doubts and she prompts him to prove to himself that he is the one and that is his journey. So she just can't tell him he's the one because that would take away part of his self discovery and do the work for him. And the Oracle can't do the work for us. We can't rely on anyone else to tell us who we are. They can help us along the path, but we can only know and feel our own truth and that comes from self knowledge. Now, if we go back to the cover of the monographs, we'll look at the third element, that of the columns or pillars. These pillars add another dimension to the invitation. They refer to the invitation to go beyond what you currently know to a new level of learning and understanding. And oftentimes when we see images of two columns, it's an ancient symbol of a gateway to new knowledge. Even though these are stylized with the Egyptian motif of the lotus flower, the columns are frequently a representation of the pillars of Hercules from antiquity. The pillars of Hercules, as you can see in this photo right here, are actually located at the entrance of the Strait of Gibraltar. And the Strait is the entrance to the Atlantic Ocean from the Mediterranean Sea. And the Strait separates the African and European continents. They're called the pillars of Hercules because of their involvement in one of Hercules's 12 labors. While he was going to the Garden of the Hesperides, he had to cross the Atlas Mountains in Northern Africa. And instead of crossing them, he forced his way through them, creating the strait. One pillar is a rock of Gibraltar on the European side, and the second pillar is a mountain on the African side. And this is the farthest west that Hercules traveled on his labors. And Plato placed the location of Atlantis beyond the strait. So the pillars of Hercules represent the limit of the known world. Tradition says that the pillars presented a warning and that warning read, nay plus ultra, nothing further beyond. So we're being told right on the cover, right up front when we enter the monographs and their teachings that we are going into new territory and we are surrendering ourselves as students of the mysteries. This is also seen in this frontispiece to Sir Francis Bacon's Instauratio Magna from 1620. There's an inscription down at the bottom and it says many will pass through and knowledge will be the greater. And it's interesting that Hercules is associated with the pillars because we are actually embarking on a hero's or heroine's journey as we cross the threshold into our studies, our meditations and our experiments. And as we continue with our practice, we allow ourselves to become more congruent, more whole, and more heart-based beings. The Rosicrucian path is very much one of discovery through personal inner experience. And through practice, we come to know our master within more intimately. And we work with our master within to discern and hone our experiences to create the lives that we desire. The more we follow the practices and learn to know ourselves, the more we're able to pierce through the veil of the world of illusion and see and move in the world with clarity and agency and become our own oracles. Now for part two, the gift. While the gift after many incarnations is to reach the perfected rose qua state, the gift that we can see and touch in our current lifetimes is that of the process of becoming the rose. I'd like to share some of the insights from long term members who've been on this journey and were generous enough to let me interview them. I interviewed four senior members that have had multiple decade long tenure in the order. They will remain anonymous and but we will be very thankful for their wisdom and perspective. I was interested in knowing how the Rosicrucian journey shaped them and in learning how they became who they are today as Rosicrucians. And I found it very inspirational to talk with everyone and I hope to convey that to you today. They have received the gift of the benefits of long term practice and we today get to receive the benefit of their sharing their generosity. 
And this is by no means meant to represent everyone. This is just the experience provided by these members that were gracious enough to, to let me talk to them. And one thing that I really loved about talking with everyone was how the teachings taught them to carve their own unique path. And so that's one of the things we'll be looking at today. Some of the themes we'll look at are daily practice, self-knowledge, service, and Rosicrucian qualities. And one of the first questions that I asked everyone was how they came to the Rosicrucian path. And it was really interesting to hear people's stories. And one woman, she didn't join the order until after her children were grown and they had left the house. But in spite of this, she had been involved in esoteric studies throughout her entire life. And she said, even as a child, she started to receive mailings from the order and she never knew who sent them. And her parents also didn't know who sent them, but she benefited from them and they're still a value and she still remembers that and treasures that experience. And another member joined after a college professor invited her to her office and told her as a student that she was going to become a Rosicrucian. And then she told her how to join. <laughs> So when we look at daily practice, this consists of a number of things. So meditations, the celestial sanctum ascent, exercises, experiments, weekly sanctum periods, and in general, living the Rosicrucian principles. Consistently across the board, each person had a daily practice that they followed. Each had chosen an assembly of practices that they most resonated with. And it was interesting to see the variety. One person focused daily on the overall exercise and vowel sounds, the sun salutation and magnetizing water. And another focused on Kabbalah meditations, the sun salutation. And she did a series of meditations with vowel sounds each morning. And she had the general daily practice of living with the Rosicrucian principles detailed in the Rosicrucian Code of Life. And here's a quote from one member. She said, I think the recommendation of setting up a sanctum and developing a constant regular period of study is necessary. Sincerity, tolerance, and perseverance are additional qualities desired. Regular and persistent study, doing the experiments, and using vowel sounds and principles for radiant health. And another Soror said that her daily routine consisted of doing a celestial sanctum ascent, a Kabbalistic meditation. She did a number of prayers. She had a planetary attunement, and she also performed her vowel sounds each morning. And she said, this is the routine that makes me feel really fulfilled. I feel those are the best tools to approach the day with gratitude, inspiration, and support. And one Soror also said, the most powerful tool is one we learn at the very beginning, the celestial sanctum. Over the years, I've added more and more details and more and more levels. And the more I've done the meditation, the more communion I have with the master within. And then another Soror said, when I asked, are there certain things that you wish you could do more of to enhance your Rosicrucian path and experience? And these are quotes from two different people and both expressed that they would spend more time in the monographs. So one said, I would study and conduct the many experiences in our monographs more consistently. And the other said, I would make time to study the monographs more. So you can see this was a common theme, the monographs and consistency of practice. And this is a continuation of my question. Are there certain things that you wish you could do more of to enhance your Rosicrucian path and experience? And another member said, this year, I really enjoyed the deep dive at Rosicrucian Park with a concentrated immersion in Rosicrucian teachings. If I could ideally make that a yearly pilgrimage, 
the reset would enhance my progress as a Rosicrucian student. And so the next theme was that of service. And service takes many forms, of course. Some examples from the members that I spoke to are serving as officers and volunteers, serving as online meeting facilitators and online meeting presenters, helping members stay on track for initiations. So one soror would touch base with different members to make sure that they were staying on track with their monographs and signing up for their temple initiations and providing transportation for seniors to attend meetings. During the pandemic, a lot of meetings stopped and a lot of people are hesitant to come back in person. So we have a number of members that are trying to make space in some of the larger assembly spaces to provide many different feet of social distancing for, for people who are still very sensitive. Then there's also the care of sick and shut-ins, so visiting members who are sick and can't get out, and then also assisting in the transition process. One soror said that she had a member who had dementia, and this particular soror had arranged for a call from the Grand Master to this member, and that this member with dementia, even though she was in and out of consciousness, she just lit up when she got the call from the Grand Master. And she went through transition a few days later. And as service being one of our underlying themes, the theme with service is generosity to and people give so much of their time and energy to benefit others and the order. And everyone provided service in a way that befitted their talents. And some members have focused exclusively on service as their main place of interest. And I thought that was very interesting. And that is where they got their greatest sense of fulfillment. And here's a quotation from one member regarding service, she said the level of compassion, the desire to serve humanity through altruism or beneficence. Once you're unfolding from each level of the monographs, you're opening up like a rose and the more light you share, I'm a more expansive version of myself. And then these are quotes from two different members. One member just said, I love to be of service. And another member, when I asked what she wanted to do to enhance her studies, she said, I would continue day to day to experience every moment and event from the Rosicrucian point of view, and I would continue to serve. And then this one soror spoke about serving at an energetic level as well. She said, at the local level, we are radiating our energy in everything that we do, everywhere we go and in every person we meet. The more involved in the studies we are, the more radiant we are, a brighter, stronger light. The energy that is being emitted is more powerful too. And our next theme is that of self-knowledge. And as a whole, these longtime members seemed very grounded in their self-knowledge. And what struck me was the grace and surety with which they knew themselves. They knew who they were, and they were very comfortable with creating their own path through the teachings and practices. They had a strong sense of what they preferred and where they were going to put their energy and focus. And after going through the monographs, they went back and focused on key areas of interest. And so each had areas that brought them the most value for their evolution. They weren't trying to focus on everything in the monographs. They were, by large part, focusing on the areas that they got the most value from. And so I asked about different topics of interest or study that people had, and there was quite a variety. Some were very well versed in the deep inner workings of the Kabbalah and use this in their daily practice. 
and others were much more focused exclusively on service in general. And here's a quote from one soror about self-knowledge. She said, from the beginning of our Rosicrucian studies, we are told that knowing oneself is the goal of all Rosicrucians. How can we grow spiritually if we don't know ourselves, the good, the bad, or the indifferent? Engaging in honest and non-judgmental self-assessment or self-analysis enables us to become aware of the areas in our lives that need to change to further our spiritual journey. And another member said, Rosicrucians are students of mysticism embarked on a journey of self-discovery towards mastery. Through the Rosicrucian teachings, they study and apply universal laws as they apply to each individual. They cultivate a relationship with the master within so that they can discover their unique course in life and live in accordance with that. And another soror said, Remember the song, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. In my silent garden, I have learned to listen, to listen to the master within. I have had many experiences in learning to know thyself. Confirmation comes as I listen to my master within. And there's a recurring theme of how self-knowledge comes more and more as we converse with the master within. Here's another quote, having certainty that the master within is there. When we truly know ourselves and the more we believe we truly know ourselves, the more expansive the contact is with the master within. We have everything within. It's taking the time to make the contact and trusting the connection. So the next section here is the result of some questions I asked about what qualities they thought described Rosicrucians. And here are some thoughts. We are striving to be tolerant, to practice unconditional universal love, to know ourselves. We try to practice humility and are conscious of our health, the health and well being of our planet. We feel generous, aspire to peace, and strive to know our place in the universe. We serve. And another member said that my personal image of qualities that identify with being a Rosicrucian can be plotted on a six pointed star or hexagon. At the first point is civility. At the second point is forgiveness. At the third point is compassion. At the fourth point is humility. At the fifth point is detachment. And at the sixth point is surrender. And in the middle, there's a dot representing unconditional cosmic love. And what I love about this is the way this Aurora created her own symbol to represent the qualities of her conception of the Rosicrucian. And this is from another Aurora committed to service. A Rosicrucian is receptive and obedient to the urgings of the master within, patient, involving the ability to take the time necessary to think things through, to be tolerant, committed to fulfilling obligations they have undertaken, loving for love is what connects us to the cosmic and others as we love and serve others we contribute to our evolution and the evolution of humanity humble in that they recognize that which is greater than themselves they value self and others and work for the highest good of all another soror said when we're around other rosicrucians there's a deep sense of pure love sisterhood and brotherhood that is indescribable to meet new members who are starting out on their path you have a connection to them too because you remember you were there yourself and what a beautiful path it's been the egregore is always present and supporting all of us even when we're just thinking about joining And from a soror here are some final thoughts on the path of working the studies. And this is part of the, the gift of becoming the rose. She says the initiatic progression fully supports our own growth and expansion. The way the monographs are written 
and delivered, and the tools that are exposed and provided at the right times. That is the reason for our loving expansion. We are given beautiful ancient tools. The unfoldment of beauty of rose ripples into areas of people's lives. And another member on becoming the rose. Destiny, karmic good fortune led me to this path. I know there are many others, so I am grateful. Bit by bit, the Rosicrucian way of life has helped me traverse this journey with less fear. Hence, I believe I can pass the terror of the threshold and courageously commune with, walk and talk with my sacred self in my own silent garden. And another member on becoming the Rose. The Rosicrucian path has helped me interact with my sacred self or what I call master within by following the Rosicrucian ontology of meditation, concentration and contemplation based on the law of the triangle. We are also dealing with the law as above, so below, as below, so above, dual triangles, which spiral as opposites and take us on our evolutionary journey. And finally, here's our last comment on becoming the rose. We are Rosicrucians because we have chosen the path of Rosicrucianism to evolve. I see it as a path, not the destination. After all, there are other traditions and paths that people can take in their quest for enlightenment. However, applying the Rosicrucian teachings in our daily living helps us grow and evolve spiritually. We are made to understand the value and power of thought. When we truly understand that we are continually creating our lives by our thoughts, we start an inward journey to replace negative self-limiting thoughts with positive uplifted thoughts. And that brings forth the manifestation of divine qualities, allowing us to radiate light, life and love. So I hope you've enjoyed this journey through the experiences and thoughts and perspective and wisdom of these members who have shared these thoughts with us. And thank you to the four senior members who graciously donated their time and energy to let me interview them and continue to ask them lots of questions. And thanks to them for all the work that they do. And thank you to everyone for all the work that you do and for participating in tonight's symposium. And thank you again for the work that you do for the order and in your local and your global spheres.